let's explore this then through the lens of creating one's own perfect life. Codify this for anybody that wants, they don't know what their ideal life looks like, they just know that they're not living it yet. So uh, step number one is take it seriously. To find out if the hypothesis is true or not, you have to take the experiment, you have to do it sincerely. What comes after that? I think even one step before that is opening yourself up to new role models and new experiences. We live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with... That's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered mind. So the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people. So then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And there's this beautiful quote by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. It's uh, so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. My identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible. I think so many people feel that way today that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about. And exactly like you said, taking it seriously, shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's going to go off and become a monk is going to feel like the way I did. And that's cool. But not everyone is going to go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result. Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through as an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, that doesn't sound like me. What would you say, like, is, a, is there a process for people to gain more self-awareness? And then what are from a behavioral, you know, just human behavior level, what are things that trip up the average person? I'm a huge fan of the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Just being able to differentiate between system one and system two, as Daniel Kahneman calls it in the Vedic philosophy we call differentiating between the mind and the intelligence. Knowing how to differentiate the voices in your head is the first level of self-awareness. System one is your initial response to anything that happened. So if you say something I don't like, my system one naturally would be a face that I pull that I'm like, I don't agree with that. That's the understanding of what system one is. It's your initial default reaction in the moment. That can be positive often. For example, if someone pulled out a knife, you feel scared and you run. That's system one. That's a good thing. It's, it's safe for you. But also system one is someone says something that hurts your ego and you start defending yourself immediately. That's a negative of system one. That we would refer to as the mind. It's built up of conditioning. Those responses are conditioned. Those default elements are all there because of habit and continuous practice. The system two is more like the intelligence. What I would say is more like the parent 
if you can consider system one to be more like a child, system two is more like a parent. It looks more at the long term, it looks more at the bigger picture. It processes that default reaction through a set of checking and metrics to decide whether that's true. The child is the, the one that wants everything right away, impatient, quickly responding, straight away reacting when it doesn't get what he wants. The intelligent parent, a good one, knows what the child wants and needs and what's better for it in the long term. Just starting there and being able to reflect and observe the different voices inside of us is a great place to start your self-awareness. Because the biggest challenge is that most of us don't know what we're listening to. And we don't, most of us don't even know that there are more than one voice inside of us. Just getting over that line is a huge win because now at least you're trying to differentiate between what you're hearing. And that's gonna help you make better decisions in the future. The biggest challenge is that there's just so much noise. It's like, have you ever had someone in your home, maybe it's your wife or maybe it's a friend or whatever, just play a really bad song too often? You just play a song and you just think, oh, turn that off. And after a while, it's been on for so long, you become immune to it. Like it's just there and it's still on. It's there in the back of your mind and you didn't manage to turn it off. So the noise that I describe in life, whether it's your parents' expectations, whether it's society's expectations, whether it's your partner's expectations, all of those are like noise in the background. And that noise drowns out your ability to understand the mind and the intelligence. That's one of the biggest trip ups. The truth is over 40 to 50% of us lie on our resumes. A lot of people lie about their dates of employment. So instead of three days, it's now three months, you know, whatever it may be. Meet some of these people and speak to people. And so I spoke to people who lie on their resumes and we know that at least 40 to 50% tell us they do. Well, the thing is, no one was proud of that. No one, no one was like, yeah, 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 I know I'm going to get... Really what it came down to is we're really insecure about our own abilities. Really what it came down to is we're not confident about what we have to offer. What it came down to is a lack of self-awareness. What it came down to is a lack of understanding. What am I good at? What am I passionate about? What am I bringing to the table? That's what people were really worried about. They were worried about the job, but when you dug beneath the surface, the real behavioral trait that was coming out was insecurity and being unconfident about one's potential. That tells us a lot. That indicates a lot about human behavior and human nature. That the noise from outside makes us want to fit into a container. And that stops us from differentiating between what is my mind saying and what is my intelligence saying. And what happens is that noise becomes your voice. So that noise becomes what you think is what you're saying. And most people don't realize that until 10, 20, 30 years down. He is as powerful as he is. Find power for me. So from a monk's perspective, the greatest power is to be self-controlled. To be able to train the mind and energy to focus it exactly where you want it and when you want it to be. You are completely detached and undeterred from external ups and downs. You're able to navigate anything that seems tough, challenging, fun, excitement, with the same amount of being equipoised and balanced and equanimity without being too excited in pleasure or being too depressed in pain. But knowing how to navigate every situation, to me, that's great strength and great power. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says that detachment is not that you own nothing. Detachment is that nothing owns you. And, and I love it because to me, that summarizes detachment in a way that it's not usually explained. Usually people see detachment as being away from everything. Actually, the greatest detachment is being close to everything and not letting it consume and own you. And that's real power. That's real strength. My three E's are element, environment, and energy. Everyone has an element that they thrive in. If you take someone out of it, their element, they won't be the same. Modern day example would be Michael Jordan. He was incredible at basketball. You took him out of basketball, put him into baseball, no one remembers his career. We're talking about one of the best athletes of all time. Your environment is the environment around you. You can take a fish out of water and give it a beautiful mansion and a Bentley and all the money in the world, but it will die. And that's what we are like our environment. Everyone needs an environment which they thrive, which we have to craw. Your boss, if you're at work, is never gonna ask you, hey, what, what environment do you succeed in, right? Like that never happens. So we have to create an environment 
where we thrive. And then finally, it's energy. We, some of us love high energy environments, high pressure. Some of us succeed in low energy environments and low pressure. Figuring out your energy and the frequency on which you operate best will help you thrive as well. So for me, those are the three E's to really create a thriving environment. Know your element, know your environment, and know your energy. And so at all times, if I see anything going wrong, I'm going, is my element out of alignment? Is my environment out of alignment? Or is my energy out of alignment? And that's a great three question test you can do to yourself when you don't think things are going right. And all you have to do is bring that back into alignment.